Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's iCentity Connect webinar. Um, I hope everyone's doing well um, and lovely to see everyone joining in today. So um, during this meeting this week, we are going to be taking a closer look at Chagas disease and particularly Chagas disease in Colombia. Now, it's really worth noting about Chagas disease that despite about 7 million people being infected worldwide, um, out of those, only a very small proportion would ever even know they have the infection and let alone receive treatment. Probably about less than 1% of those infected both have a diagnosis and a treatment. Um, so clearly, despite the existence and availability of a treatment uh, for Chagas disease, access issues really remain a massive hurdle um, in trying to control this disease. Uh, so to take us through some of these um, issues, it's my great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Colin Forsyth. Hi, Colin. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me here. Thank you so much. And uh, Colin, you are a research and project manager at the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, the DNDI. Uh, and so it's really our pleasure to have you here today. The DNDI has been really putting at the core of its programs and leading the charge in terms of these overcoming these access bottlenecks to the um, treatment of Chagas disease in patients. So um, it's our pleasure to have you here today. And in particular, we wanted to invite you, given the recent publication uh, of a paper, which we'll share a little bit later on, looking at the on-site experience of a project to increase access to diagnosis and treatment of Chagas disease in high-risk endemic areas of Colombia. So a program which is a very collaborative in approach involving and including the communities and which has led to a really impressive reduction um, in terms of uh, those patients we were talking about missed by the diagnosis and the treatment and with lots of lessons not just for Chagas disease but for outreach in terms of many tropical diseases. So Colin without any further delay um, I'd like to thank you once again uh, for your time today and uh, we're looking forward to hearing all about this important work. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, and, and many thanks to ISNTD for, for giving us this opportunity to, to share our experience. And I'll just uh, introduce myself really quickly while the presentation goes up. Uh, I'm with, uh, I'm Colin uh, with the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. And I'm going to share the results of a project uh, in which we were involved with several partners uh, to improve access to diagnosis and treatment for Chagas disease in Colombia. And for those of you who don't uh, know us as well, uh, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative is a nonprofit organization dedicated to developing treatments for a series of conditions uh, which primarily impact vulnerable populations. And so here is a list of some of the major diseases that we're working on. And uh, since DNDI's founding in 2003, Chagas disease has, has been a priority. And uh, Chagas disease is a, is a neglected parasitic infection for which only two drugs are available and those were both developed over 50 years ago. Uh, they have uh, pretty strong limitations including a long treatment period and uh, frequent and sometimes severe adverse effects uh, especially in adult patients. And uh, as Marianne had mentioned only about one percent of those uh, who are infected have had access to both diagnosis and treatment. So uh, early on, DNDI was developed, was involved in the development of a pediatric formulation for Chagas disease. And then recently, uh, DNDI has been uh, involved in an initiative to improve access to the current treatments available. Uh, we also continue work in development, uh, both of a safer and shorter treatment with benzmidazole, which is one of the current drugs, 
as well as in identifying uh, new drugs that might be effective against the disease and uh, engaging in clinical research. So Chagas disease, uh, just give a really brief background if, in case you're less familiar with it. It's caused by Trypanosoma cruzi, a uh, flagellate protozoan. As Marianne mentioned, it affects an estimated six to seven million people worldwide. And of those, uh, over a million have gone on to develop uh, cardiomyopathy or, or to have experienced uh, heart disease as a result of their infection. Um, but there is a very long asymptomatic period, so most people are not aware they are infected. It disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, and it causes an economic toll of around $8 billion annually if we take into account both healthcare expenses and economic losses. Uh, there's really four main avenues of transmission. Uh, most people are infected through kissing bugs, uh, which are uh, called uh, pitos in Colombia and uh, various other names, depending on what part of Latin America you're in. And these are nocturnal blood sucking insects, which many of whom carry the parasite in their gut. And what happens is when they when they bite someone at night, uh, they usually defecate after feeding, and the person who's sleeping uh, unconsciously usually scratches the bite side and unintentionally uh, introduces the parasite into their bloodstream and becomes infected. Uh, also, if the mother is infected, ranging between 1% to 5% of births uh, also acquire the infection. And it can also be transmitted through blood transfusion and organ transplant. Uh, or through consumption of food that's been contaminated by triatomines or their feces. And there's really two main phases of the disease. Uh, the acute phase following transmission uh, most of the time is asymptomatic. Uh, in some cases, though, it can be severe or potentially fatal. Uh, but usually when there are symptoms, they resemble sort of other common illnesses, and so people don't recognize it as Chagas disease as such. And the upshot is that the vast majority of people don't realize that, that they're infected. Uh, it then goes into a long chronic phase, which is indeterminate or asymptomatic, and uh, this is lifelong. However, uh, about 30 to 40% of people with the infection will eventually develop serious complications affecting the heart, digestive system, or in some cases, the nervous system. And usually the onset is 10 to 30 years after the initial infection. So this is just a map sort of showing the main areas that are impacted by Chagas disease. Uh, it is endemic in much of Latin America. Uh, so the countries with the highest burden tend to be in Latin America, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Bolivia, and you can see Colombia there. Uh, but there's also a substantial number of people uh, with the infection who are living in non-endemic areas, uh, including uh, Europe and the United States. This is just a graphic which uh, characterizes both the global burden and the neglect of Chagas disease. Uh, so if we look at the whole, uh, sort of the whole circle that's represented here, uh, this is, uh, you know, the entire population of people with T. cruzi infection, which we said is between six to seven million people, according to estimates. Uh, of those, a little over two million uh, would not be would not have an indication for antiparasitic treatment, either because they've already progressed uh, to severe complications or because of advanced age or other factors. Uh, but that still leaves in the gray circle there uh, about 4 million people who could be eligible for, for antiparasitic treatment. And then you can see an even smaller number in the green circle represents uh, the people who've had access to diagnosis and this is estimated to be less than half a million or less than 7% of the total. 
And finally, the little uh, black circle in the middle represents people who've actually accessed treatment, which according to our best guess uh, is still less than 70,000. And so that represents about 1% of the total and about 16% of the people who are able to access diagnosis. Uh, so what this means is we face really two major barriers. Uh, the first one is just getting people with the infection tested, and, and that's a huge one. But also, once people have actually gotten tested, there's a challenge in linking them to treatment. And the reasons for this are, are, are diverse and, and multifactorial. Uh, and this is just uh, a, a diagram kind of representing, you know, the different barriers for Chagas disease. And we can think of them as really coming from four different dimensions, uh, structural, systemic, clinical, and psychosocial. So structural barriers have to do with political and economic inequalities, which put uh, vulnerable populations, both put them at greater risk for disease and also make it more difficult for them to access uh, healthcare resources. Systemic barriers are gaps in the, in the healthcare system, which limit its ability to provide care for people with Chagas disease. And so these are things like uh, maybe not having uh, stock of, of drugs and tests available in near communities where patients live, also, low awareness among healthcare personnel of Chagas disease and its risk factors is, is a big challenge. Uh, clinical barriers are the kinds of things which DNDI is trying to address through its clinical research, DNDI and many other organizations. Uh, and these are things uh, like the, you know, the toxicity of the medications that I mentioned before. Uh, there's challenges in the diagnostic process. And we also don't have a very good test of cure right now. Uh, so it's, we have limitations in being able to see how effective treatment is. And psychosocial barriers are, are attitudes in society or sometimes within patients uh, that, that make it challenging for people to uh, want to seek diagnosis for Chagas disease. So things like stigma or, or fear about the implications of having the infection. And I want to focus uh, in the first part of the presentation really on, on the diagnostic barriers, uh, because I think that's the first thing that the, the project in Colombia really had to, to confront. Uh, so we have you know, over 90% of the estimated patient population undiagnosed. And a big reason is just most people aren't feeling any symptoms and they aren't aware that they got in the infection. So uh, what, there's nothing that's driving them to seek, a, to seek testing from their healthcare provider. Uh, there's also no gold standard for testing. So there's no test that has sufficient sensitivity and specificity to act as a standalone. And this means that we need to use two, or in some cases, three uh, different types of tests in order to reach a diagnosis. And there are various uh, tests out there based on, on different principles, uh, but there's a lot of variability between those different products. There's also uh, variability across populations in terms of, you know, how, how our diagnostic tools might perform. And this could be because of the uh, substantial genetic diversity of the T. cruzi parasite, which uh, does have a geographic patterning to it. It could have to do with geographically patterned differences in people's immune responses. And in some cases, there could be issues with uh, cross reactions with other types of infections. Uh, and also within the same population, you have variation in people's immune responses uh, to T. cruzi, uh, which might affect our ability to detect the infection. Um, some studies have suggested that uh, because a lot of the times manufacturers might use very clearly defined uh, positive and negative populations uh, when uh, assessing, assessing the different tests, uh, it could result in an overestimation 
of, of their performance characteristics. Uh, because in the real world, what happens is we have a broad range of, of uh, different immune responses. And uh, there's even a small subset of people uh, who, uh, in whom it's very hard to determine uh, if they have the infection or not. And, and lack of systems of, of, of quality control in many settings for, for the tests that are available. Uh, there can also be regulatory barriers that affect what tests are available in a particular country. And within the health system, uh, in most cases, there's a lack of routine screening as, as part of uh, health care, and especially via primary health care. Uh, and again, the need to use multiple tests, create complexity, and as I mentioned, low awareness among healthcare personnel. So because of the long asymptomatic period and, and, and patients not being aware of the infection, we really need a provider-driven screening. And so having a high awareness of risk factors among providers who work with populations at risk for Chagas disease is extremely important. So uh, as DNDI has traditionally been a drug development organization, uh, but uh, made a decision to get more involved in, in working toward uh, increasing access to the products that are available right now, and, and particularly for Chagas disease. And part of the reason for this was uh, to make sure that, you know, when a new product does come available through the pipeline, that the health system has the systems and processes in place uh, to be able to quickly get that to patients. And so as DNDI was determining how to implement this strategy and, and where to implement, uh, several factors were taken into consideration. Uh, first of all, you know, where, where to implement a project. So, the, the, the key factors to take into account were, you know, the local epidemiology and burden of disease. Uh, if there are local champions, so people who are, could be clinicians, could be investigators, could be public health authorities who are committed to, to working against Chagas disease. Uh, the political commitment at, at the national and local levels is extremely important. And, and this is really what makes the project work in, in Colombia. Uh, local capacity in terms of having uh, healthcare facilities and nearby uh, laboratory facilities. Uh, what's the regulatory landscape? So how is access to drug treatment achieved? Uh, and what are the diagnostic products available? Uh, what's the health policy landscape? What is the current state of transmission? Has vector transmission been interrupted? And, and what's the local uh, research capacity? So uh, everything in, in this project and really the way that DNDI works is through a partnership model. Uh, so this is a, a collaborative design where, where DNDI has worked with the Colombian Ministry of Health and, and various other partners to, to implement this model. Uh, and really uh, what we're talking about today is a pilot project so the idea is to smart to start at a small scale and by doing that you know demonstrate feasibility uh, determine what works and what doesn't work and what needs improvement uh, before scaling up more broadly and hopefully uh, build a success case so if you can show in a specific context that it is possible to break down these barriers and provide uh, access to people for testing and treatment for Chagas disease, uh, it, it really justifies the case to scale that up more broadly. And because you're starting small, uh, there's a lower investment uh, and, and it also helps uh, the sustainability of the project um, because you're not doing, DNDI is not doing everything on its own, but rather the the results that we're talking about today are all thanks to the health system and all occurred within the health system. Uh, and as part of uh, this experience, uh, DNDI uh, has developed a simple methodology for access projects, uh, which we're calling the 4D methodology. 
based on the four components involved, uh, diagnose, design, deliver, and demonstrate impact. And uh, as you can see, part of demonstrating impact involves looking at what worked and what hasn't worked uh, to see if you need to go back and retool certain things. So the first step, diagnose, uh, really involves two major parts. Uh, first is a situational assessment uh, where you gather information on what the current epidemiology is, uh, what's the state of prevention, uh, access to diagnosis and treatment, uh, what are the baseline data, what are the gaps and barriers, and also what are the opportunities and uh, policy windows. As I mentioned, the, the commitment and, and partnership with uh, government is, is critical for making this work. And you also take stock of what are the other organizations, uh, you know, locally or, or relevant organizations internationally who are working on Chagas disease in that particular context. Uh, the next step is to organize an access seminar where you bring together uh, different stakeholders from healthcare, government, civil society, academia, uh, international organizations, industry, uh, among others, but all of the different people who are working on Chagas disease uh, in, the, in the area where you want to implement the project. And the key here is, uh, as a group, you're collectively identifying what are the primary barriers to preventing, detecting, and treating Chagas disease. Uh, so this is not you know, DMDI coming in and saying, okay, this is the problem and this is what we need to do, but rather uh, working with all of the different stakeholders to identify collectively, you know, what are the key priorities and what needs to be done. So in the next step uh, in the design process, uh, in response to the barriers that were collectively identified, uh, you develop responses and uh, really, this is, this is a process that goes beyond the seminar I mentioned. Uh, develop an access plan uh, in conjunction with, uh, with partners and ideally aligned with uh, WHO PAHO objectives for, for Chagas disease. Uh, establish clear objectives and timeframes uh, and determine who's responsible for each of the different actions. Uh, collecting baseline data on, on the areas where you want to measure, uh, determining, you know, what are the key variables you need to measure to track impact, uh, what are the capacity building and HR needs, and uh, what are the community needs in terms of uh, developing materials for information education and communication. The third step of uh, deliver is really the implementation phase uh, where you implement the access plan that's been collectively developed uh, with active engagement of, of local stakeholders, uh, encouraging local ownership. And so in this, in this phase, and especially in the pilot project, there's a heavy emphasis on training and capacity building and really uh, developing people who can then go on and take these lessons uh, elsewhere and, and, and scale up the project. So training the trainers, uh, implement an information education and communication strategy, and, and prospectively collect data to help you uh, monitor and evaluate your impact. And then the last uh, step in this is, is demonstrating impact, which is uh, collecting and analyzing data on, on the indicators you've developed uh, to evaluate results and to retool uh, and refine the plan if necessary, and then share evidence both with the different stakeholders involved in the project uh, and externally uh, to get input and, and to share with the public health community. Uh, so that's kind of the sort of the methodological background. And now I'm going to talk more specifically about, about Colombia and how the project was implemented in Colombia. So just a quick overview of Chagas disease in Colombia. There's over an estimated uh, by the estimates suggest over 400,000 people with the infection in Colombia. And a study came out a few years back 
uh, suggesting less than 1% of, of that number has been tested or treated. Uh, 1,000 babies born each year with, with congenital infection and over 130,000 people living uh, with, with Chagas-related heart disease. These are all according to the WHO estimates. Uh, annual health care costs are projected at more than $175 million annually. And again, the infection is primarily in uh, affecting uh, uh, people who are in rural area, the rural poor, uh, and especially uh, indigenous communities, uh, migrants who were displaced by, by the conflict several years ago and who might now be living in urban areas. Uh, so in 2015, uh, DNDI and several other uh, partners, including uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, participated in a seminar uh, toward the elimination of barriers to access and treatment for Chagas disease. And, and during the during this event, uh, several important things happened. Uh, the Ministry of Health affirmed Chagas disease as an important public health problem and its commitment uh, to addressing the problem. Uh, really not just during the seminar, but the process was begun to create a, a patient-centered roadmap for Chagas disease. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, commitment was made to update official Chagas treatment guidelines. And uh, the diagnostic barrier was identified as being particularly important. So plans were made to simplify diagnosis and, and move it to the primary healthcare level, uh, increase training of, of healthcare personnel and empower uh, communities to carry out diagnosis and treatment locally. And as I mentioned, there is broad participation uh, from not just from Chagas experts and public health officials, but uh, uh, patient groups in Colombia and other actors. And so out of the seminar, um, the plan was made to develop a pilot project to implement uh, a patient-centered road care map for Chagas disease. And this uh, slide is just demonstrating some of the many uh, partners that were involved uh, in Colombia, uh, including the, the Ministry of Health, the National Health Institute of Colombia, and uh, several uh, local governments and local public health departments. And this graphic, I, I doubt you'll be able to see the text in the boxes, but this is just to show you what I mean by the patient-centered roadmap for Chagas disease. And this is just assuring that uh, for, every, for every patient, uh, there's a specific route of care depending on uh, depending on their risk factors and, and depending on their clinical need uh, that is detailed and then and then provided through the health system. And the goal here is really to simplify the steps in the diagnosis and treatment process. So reducing the number of appointments that are needed uh, for patients to get a diagnosis and emphasizing the role of primary health care. So uh, really the first critical aspect of the project was addressing the diagnostic barrier and simplifying the diagnostic process. So with about 438,000 people estimated to have the infection and nearly 5 million people at risk, uh, there's a lot of people uh, in need of testing. And when I spoke earlier about the genetic diversity of, of T. cruzi, uh, there's also that diversity is reflected in Colombia. Uh, T. cruzi 1 is considered the predominant genetic lineage, but other, other scenarios are also present. And only about 1.2% of the at-risk population had been screened uh, when we started the project. Uh, there were significant barriers to overcoming, to obtaining confirmatory testing. Uh, and so what the what happened at the time was, you know, uh, different uh, serological tests or ELISAs were used 
uh, depending on what part of, uh, depending on the clinic, the healthcare facility. Uh, and uh, confirmation was done using an in-house uh, indirect immunofluorescence assay. And uh, the problem was that this process was very difficult to scale up, especially considering uh, uh, some of the departments and areas where, where patients were living. Uh, there was also a low availability of testing in primary health care. And all of this created a situation where uh, it was difficult for patients uh, to get their initial screening. And also, if they screened positive, uh, getting confirmatory testing might not have been available uh, nearby and could in entail uh, travel, you know, in some cases, pretty long travel in order just to get a confirmatory test. And so you had about a third of people uh, never did go on to get that confirmatory test. And in other cases, there would be long delays. Uh, so just homing in, honing in on the uh, use of immunofluorescence assay as a confirmatory test, uh, it was difficult for, uh, to reproduce uh, the reagents that were necessary and hard to scale this up. So. What that meant was that while the test uh, could be made available in, in Bogota and a few other places, it was difficult to scale that up and have it available in some of the apartment departments where Chagas disease is endemic. Uh, the test requires uh, extensive training and uh, has high needs in terms of equipment and maintenance, uh, and it was not an automated it's not an automated result, so there was some subjectivity in the interpretation of results. Uh, at the time we started the project, uh, it was not included in, in most of the major insurance plans, meaning that patients had to self-pay. And, and as I mentioned, it was difficult to decentralize, so it's only available in a few reference centers. Uh, so the National Institute of Health and, and DNDI and others uh, participated in a diagnostic study to, to help determine how to simplify this process. And the study involved inviting manufacturers of different commercial releases in Colombia uh, to submit their products to participate in a validation study. And eventually, seven releases, which are registered in Colombia, were included in the assessment. And a panel of 500 samples, uh, the vast majority of which were from Colombian patients, uh, was used. And this was initially characterized uh, using four assays, uh, including the in-house uh, immunofluorescence assay, which I mentioned earlier. The different ELISAs were characterized for sensitivity and specificity based on the above characterization. Uh, so what the study was doing was determining if uh, ELISAs, which were commercially available in Colombia, uh, could be used in a new diagnostic algorithm, which would have comparable sensitivity and specificity uh, to the previous algorithm, which had good sensitivity and specificity, but was difficult to, to scale up. And so the results of the study showed that uh, five of the seven ELISAs had sensitivity over 98%, and six of the seven had a specificity over 97%. And so based on this, a new diagnostic algorithm was developed, which involves using two different types of ELISAs or two ELISAs based on different principles. And uh, the first uh, was determined a, a total extract ELISA would be used, followed by a recombinant ELISA. And so the immunofluorescence assay was only reserved for those cases where these two uh, results were discordant. And this uh, is the new diagnostic algorithm that was implemented in the pilot project. And it was also used in the certification process for the elimination of, of vector transmission. So this is just a table kind of showing the advantages of this new algorithm compared to the previous algorithm. So uh, the new algorithm uh, was covered by insurance companies. Uh, it only required one dr blood draw 
uh, in the clinic that was near to where patients lived. So this eliminated the need for cost of travel and expenses for patients. Uh, the reagents that were needed did not have to be produced in house. They were commercially available. The use of automated readers uh, reduced the training needs and also meant that uh, these and these could also be available in most private and public laboratories. Uh, and the same equipment could be used for, for both ELISAs. The results were automated, limiting you know, subjectivity in the interpretation of results. And finally, you know, an evidence-based guideline was available for, for screening and the use of complementary tests. So with the new algorithm available, uh, the pilot project was implemented in, in five municipalities uh, that were selected in four endemic departments. And I'll, I'll show you a map on the next slide. Uh, the municipalities that were selected for the pilot project, uh, it was based on a few different criteria. Uh, first of all, these communities were all involved in the certification, in the national certification plan for the interruption of, of uh, domestic transmission by Rodneus prolixus, which is one of the main species of uh, kissing bugs in Colombia that transmits the infection. And so, you know, after, after uh, transmission by this species was interrupted, uh, the, the idea was this project would play a complementary role by now providing uh, treatment to those communities uh, with the risk of re-exposure and reinfection having been uh, limited. Uh, also, uh, interest of uh, departmental and municipal level authorities in participating in the project was taken into consideration and what the history in each uh, municipality was in terms of healthcare processes for Chagas disease. Uh, so the municipality that were selected had different epidemiological contexts, and also different healthcare levels. Uh, so while some only had primary healthcare facilities, um, in a couple, there were what's called in Columbia level two facilities or somewhat more advanced facilities. Uh, the projects were implemented in the different municipalities uh, in a staggered way between 2017 and 2019. And uh, key variables were developed and data collection was, was implemented. Uh, this is a map showing uh, where the pilot where the municipalities participating in the pilot project are. Uh, you see that they're all in, uh, in uh, the eastern part of Colombia, which is an area that's, that's endemic for Chagas disease. Uh, these are some of the key indicators that were developed to uh, track the impact of the project. Uh, so we wanted to know how many people were tested overall, how many among those were, were pregnant women, how many went on to get a confirmed positive diagnosis, uh, and how many cases did we need to get a third test because the first and second tests were discordant. Uh, were all the patients who were positive getting a consultation? And then, you know, how many patients went on to get antitrypanosomal treatment and how many needed other types of care for, or because they had, you know, advanced complications from Chagas disease. And then once treated, how many people had to discontinue due to side effects? How many were maintaining the annual follow-up visits? But uh, in addition to the numbers of people, uh, we also wanted to check the process times. So how long was it taking between the time the test was initially ordered and the time that confirmed diagnosis was, was available? And then from there, how long was it taking between the time patients were diagnosed and the time they were able to initiate treatment? Other things uh, to consider were, you know, how many, uh, how many people received training for testing and treatment of Chagas disease through the project. Uh, we also wanted to know the impact of demographic factors, uh, gender in particular, uh, were there any differences between the communities of residents? 
And also uh, insurance. So Columbia has a system of universal healthcare coverage. There's two main types of insurance, uh, subsidized insurance uh, supported by the government, and whereas other people have private insurance uh, through, through employment or other means. And finally, uh, age. So the implementation of the project uh, really put a heavy focus on training and, and capacity building, and also the development of information, education, and communication. So initially, uh, reference positions for the project uh, were sent to Bolivia to receive training in Chagas disease uh, treatment and di diagnosis and treatment from the Bolivian Chagas platform, uh, which ha already has substantial uh, experience uh, working with patients for Chagas disease. Uh, so we're grateful to them for, for, for providing that training. Uh, and then from there, uh, formal direct training of healthcare personnel in the different municipalities in, in diagnosis and treatment of Chagas disease uh, was provided and ongoing training and seminars also took place outside of the, the pilot project uh, in, in Bogota and other cities. Another important activity was ensuring that stock was available uh, for tests, also for drugs and, and other supplies. Uh, and also uh, in, in each of the clinics, uh, capacity building had to take place uh, to ensure that patients who needed to start treatment also had access to all the complementary tests that are needed for treatment, such as uh, tests of renal and, and hepatic function. Uh, manuals, updated manuals were made available in each clinic. And then information and education materials were developed uh, based on focus groups and interviews with patients, communities, and, and healthcare personnel. And so printed materials were provided uh, on Chagas disease for, for healthcare personnel to use, and another set for uh, community members and patients, and also uh, radio broadcasts uh, talking about the availability of the project and uh, focusing on some of the important messages that came out of the focus groups. So, for example, uh, emphasizing that treatment for Chagas disease is available and, and is available for, for adults as well as children uh, in, in their communities. And this is just an example of uh, some of the information, education, and, and communication materials that, that were developed. Uh, as you can see, uh, a graphic artist was hired. So uh, just simple and straightforward uh, messages about Chagas disease and also uh, guides uh, that patients could use while they were completing their treatment. It's a very long treatment process. And so uh, this helped patients keep track. Now I'm gonna go in and, and, and talk about uh, some of the overall results of the project. Uh, so in the five communities, the, the testing was implemented at, at different times, but this gives a total of you know, numbers of people that had been tested at, at the time we, we, cut off, uh, we cut off the reporting period. And so we have uh, 5,654 who were tested for Chagas disease in total and uh, a good distribution between the different municipalities uh, with, with Soata and Arauca having the highest numbers. This graphic just shows the, the breakdown uh, by age group, first of all, and by gender. If we look at the age group, we can see that uh, about half of the people who were tested were between the ages of 20 and 39 and about a quarter were under 20. And these were the kind of results uh, that we wanted to see uh, because with Chagas disease, it's important to detect the infection early uh, before complications have time to develop. And really the earlier you can catch it, and especially in children, the better. As you can see, there's a, a predominance of women 
uh, were, were tested uh, compared to men. And a big part of the reason for this was that the testing was linked to the prenatal care that women were receiving uh, in these municipalities. And so over half of those women uh, were tested as part of their, their prenatal care. Again, this is important because uh, we want to ensure that pregnant women uh, receive testing if they have risk factors so that we can uh, catch congenital transmission. And also just in general, uh, it's important to screen women of childbearing age uh, because if we can treat those women, all the evidence suggests that future births, uh, the, in future births, the risk of congenital transmission is pretty much eliminated. And uh, here, these are just the results in terms of uh, who was positive for, for T. Cruzy. And again, these results are very skewed because uh, a lot of the patients already, there, there was suspicion of exposure in, in a lot of the patients already. So this is a clinical sample. Uh, but as you can see, of all of the people who were tested uh, between 11 and 12%, had uh, confirmed uh, T. Cruzy uh, diagnosis, T. Cruzy infection. And uh, we saw a much higher rate among men compared to, compared to women. Also, as you see in Chagas disease, typically the prevalence increases with age. And so in the highest age groups, we, we had a very high prevalence. This is just a graphic showing uh, what was going on with the process times. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of the, the arrow there is, is the, when the medical order was provided and at the end of the arrow would be when the confirmed result was available. And so the total process time was now taking uh, 19 days, uh, which was an excellent result as, as I'll show you a comparison, you know, before what we had with the baseline uh, in in a subsequent slide. Uh, it was slightly longer for people who had positive results, uh, which is understandable uh, due to the need for for a second test. And we also saw that it was uh, longer for men than women. Part of that might be confounded by the fact that more men were, were positive. Uh, and it was just slightly, it was slightly longer for people with the contributive or, or private insurance programs compared to subsidized insurance. And this is just sort of a graphic comparing uh, numbers of people that were tested uh, at baseline and after the project implementation. So the baseline is taking into account uh, the year uh, before the project was implemented or in some cases, we took an average of the three years before the project was implemented. Um, and then uh, in the second column after the roadmap. Uh, so you can see that there was a significant increase in each of the municipalities. And overall, uh, the end result was a little over five times as many people were tested after the implementation of the Chagas Disease Care Roadmap compared to the year before that, that implementation. And this graphic is just kind of showing the, the growth and the number of people tested by, by year. So what we have in the first column is the baseline, the year before implementation in all five communities, a little over 400 people were tested. Uh, if we look at the first year for the different pilots, and again, they were implemented at different times, uh, we saw that increase uh, substantially. And we saw that trend continue into the second year, uh, even though uh, we had incomplete data for one of the municipalities, we didn't get a full second year uh, before the cutoff period. And uh, all signs pointed in those communities where we did have a third year, we saw the trend increasing. Uh, and, and then, you know, the, the, the pandemic happened and, and, and so it's hard to tell how that would have continued. Uh, but overall, we saw 
an increase uh, that was sustained after the first year, which was what we were hoping to see. And, and this graphic is comparing the times that it was taking, uh, the, the diagnostic confirmation process was taking before and after the pro project was implemented. So if you look in the, the first column, uh, baseline before implementation in all the communities, uh, it was taking patients uh, between 90 days to well over a year uh, to complete the diagnostic process on, on average. And the average for total for the communities was 258 days. And as I mentioned, after the implementation of the roadmap, we were able to reduce that to 19 days. And a lot of this had to do with implementing the simplified diagnostic algorithm based on the on the two commercial elases, which is why I, uh, I wanted to spend significant time on, on that at the beginning. So that means that it's taking patients um, about 90% less time or 13 times less time uh, to complete the diagnostic process. And along with that, also fewer, fewer appointments and, and less travel, less out-of-pocket costs for patients. Uh, so how did this translate into access uh, to treatment? The, the table here is, is comparing that before and after the project. Um, so at baseline in the five municipalities, uh, per year about 28 people uh, were, were getting treatment for Chagas disease. And after the implementation of the roadmap, that increased about four times to an average of 109 people per year. Uh, also, the days between somebody getting diagnosed and treated uh, decreased from 354 before the project to 135 after the project. Uh, in total, 266 patients uh, went on to initiate treatment. A lot of other patients are still pending. Uh, a lot of people who were, were identified also were uh, pregnant women and who need to postpone starting treatment until after breastfeeding. Uh, we did see that uh, all the municipalities increased the number of patients initiating treatment. Uh, three out of the five municipalities decreased the overall time between diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we don't have the baseline data on the times uh, for one of the municipalities, uh, Arauca and Tame. Uh, in one municipality, we saw the time actually increase slightly. And uh, so this was one of the lessons learned uh, in the project. Um, once you start testing more people, uh, you have a demand for treatment increase. And so this places uh, a demand that wasn't there before in terms of uh, making, having stock available and, and having providers available. Uh, so one way that this was addressed was uh, we hired a, a, a consultant physician to provide treatment to speed up the, the process in that, in that municipality. Uh, over 70% of the patients who were treated were female and 31% were under the age of 39. Uh, two thirds of the patients were treated with nifertimox, uh, which is generally what's available in the Colombian uh, health system to treat Chagas disease. And another third were treated with, uh, with the other drug, benzmidazole. So to sort of summarize uh, what the impact of the project was, uh, a simplified testing process was implemented with a 92% reduction in wait times for test results. It's been scaled up to 22 new municipalities in Colombia so far, and uh, over five times as many people were tested per year compared to baseline. And I guess the, the main uh, challenges or lessons learned uh, Having the political commitment of authorities and a collaborative design are critical, that all activities take place as part of the normal healthcare process. 
once you increase access to testing, it may reveal new bottlenecks. Uh, simplification of the treatment process still remains an urgent need. Uh, it's a lengthy process with a lot of complementary testing required. Uh, there's an interesting gender dimension to access, which uh, you can see in some of the results. And if we went on, we could still improve this process using rapid tests and possibly simplify and speed it up further. Uh, the project is currently being scaled up to other departments in Colombia, and I think special strategies will be needed to reach uh, the many patients who are living in urban areas and also uh, indigenous communities and, and other communities who have particular access challenges. And uh, sorry that that went so long, but I'll, st I'll stop there and hopefully we, we still have a few minutes for questions. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Colin. That was um, a fascinating presentation. And beyond that, it really kind of demonstrated on so many levels in the extent and the efforts which DNDR are making to translate this um, vision of not just developing, improving treatments, but also of actually seeing them reach those communities. So that was really very inspiring the 4D approach and also your efforts in terms of making all the way from the brochures and communications aspect of things all the way to really understanding the communities that you're working with. So thank you so much. Um, that, that was a fantastic presentation. At this point, I'd also like to salute and say hello to Andrea Marchial, who I believe is in the audience from DNDI as well, and uh, the National Institute of Health Columbia being one of your partners on this project as well as um, numerous local and national um, health bodies so uh, wonderful collaborative project and hello and congratulations Andrea as well as a corresponding author on this paper uh, that also gives me a nice opportunity to share the um, publication that just came out in Acta Tropica to those who are interested in finding out more I've shared a pdf I believe I hope um, that has reached all. And in a few moments, I can also post, um, hopefully this will work, a direct link to the paper too. There we go, it's in, in the chat at the moment. So I hope that that's reached everyone for a copy of the paper. Um, I'll just read a few of the comments that have come up on the chat. Um, Professor Julia DeLeo tuning in from California saying, great, thank you. Um, we've got colleagues who have joined us, uh, Helena Oliartha from Jakarta, uh, Sarah Mohammed from Sudan, Derek Robinson from Bordeaux, and many, many more. So thank you for joining us and thank you, Colin. And I suppose really the thing that um, I'd like to ask you first and foremost, given the um, what you have told us about all the way from the barriers to access um, whether psychosocial, whether clinical, being so applicable to other NTDs. Um, how do you see this particular type of project, this sort of work um, and this approach really, how do you see that working for other diseases and do you have specific diseases in mind? Or in fact, um, if you wanted to extend the pilot to more widely to Colombia, how would you see the next steps? Um, thanks, Marianne, and thank you. I also want to send a big shout out to to Andrea, who uh, manages our access projects and who really much more than me is the, the person that makes all of this happen. Um, and in terms of, you know, applying the 4D model to uh, other neglected diseases, I think it, it definitely has applicability, especially for those uh, infections which are sort of hidden and often go undetected so thinking about things like uh, you know hepatitis c which shares a lot of uh, shares a lot of that element in common with with chagas disease and so i think anywhere where you have um, a condition that's uh, not being addressed due to complexities in the in the testing and, and treatment processes uh, this kind of collaborative model uh, working in pilot projects first uh, to figure out the best approach uh, could be applied to, to a pretty wide range of diseases. 
And uh, just to, to speak a little bit more about the scale up process. So, so Columbia has a national plan for interrupting transmission by the vector, which takes into account uh, a large number of communities. And so as that as that process moves forward, which which it has uh, very impressively, uh, sort of the role is is of this project is to to scale up and provide treatment to, to communities where where the vector transmission has been interrupted. So so eventually that could be a high number uh, of communities in the endemic uh, area of Chagas disease for Colombia. Wonderful, and uh, we we do hope to share this approach far and wide um, because there's really a lot of lessons um, embedded there. Thank you for that. Um, something that we did pick up on during your presentation, which was quite interesting, contrarily to perhaps other neglected tropical diseases, um, in your program, you were able to reach women more than men, interestingly, because of the linkages with the antenatal care. And so I was just wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit more um, in terms of um, the gender dimension uh, with regards to access and treatment, um, specifically for people with Chagas disease. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of different things that work there. So uh, while we did see, you know, a higher proportion of <clears throat> of women who were tested in the project, it, it doesn't mean that access was easy for all of the women in those municipalities. Uh, so just through uh, focus group studies and other ways, you know, we know that some women had challenges in order to be able to get to the clinic uh you, you know they're alone with with their kids all day the clinics are only open during the day and so it would be difficult for them to get away so so there's still uh access issues to address there and on the other hand uh oftentimes we've seen in different chagas disease projects that we get more women uh coming forward to initiate treatment than men and uh Part of that might have to do, you know, with the fact that it's an asymptomatic disease. And uh, I think there's, you know, in the literature, there's some suggestion that, that men are more reluctant to start treatment unless, you know, there's really dramatic symptoms, uh, which in Chagas disease, you know, we want people to get treatment before they experience those, those symptoms. Uh, so uh, a lot of, you know, when we conducted focus groups, some of the men mentioned that, you know, when treatment took place, there were a lot of restrictions on foods, on, on alcohol, and on things like that, that really limited their their social participation in their communities. And so uh, that might be one of the reasons why we see less men going on to treatment. Uh, but it definitely has a huge impact going in both directions. That's really interesting. There's lots of very different things at play here um, and good to untangle this a bit. We had an interesting question here from Dr. Damien Perez Maslia. I'm not sure if you know each other. Um, I believe, Dr. Maslia, you're from the Hulk York Medical School, although originally Argentinian. And Damien is asking, um, I noticed that in your patient-centered roadmap, no etiological treatment is offered to chronic or indeterminate patients. Uh, what's the reason for this? Uh, it's been shown that treatment of these individuals helps preventing the development of cardiac disease. Yeah, uh, no, uh, we definitely do offer treatment to uh, patients in the, in the chronic indeterminate phase. Uh, that, that's, that's absolutely the emphasis. So sorry if anything there was, was, was unclear. Uh, the only, you know, patients who wouldn't be eligible are patients who've already developed uh, severe, severe complications. Uh, so basically, uh, treatment is provided according to the World Health, uh, the Pan American Health Organization uh, recommendations, which, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, so as long as patients are in that indeterminate phase, uh, we do want to get them treatment if, if all other indications are there. And uh, Damien replied, oh, wonderful, my wrong, great to know. <laughs> well, we just thought it was good to ask the question just to clarify that. So yeah. there are no wrong questions. Uh, thank you <laughs> no, for not asking. at all. It was good to emphasize that point. Too. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Another question that's come in here from Dr. Derek Robinson from the University of Bordeaux, who's asking, uh, what is the best easy to use diagnostic kit that could be used by trainees? Can diagnosis be improved? So there are several um, kits out there. You know, uh, there's even several rapid tests for Chagas disease. So I'm not a diagnostic expert, but I would say that the best option in, in this experience was those that involve where you have an automatic uh, reader available. And, and really the holy grail uh, for Chagas disease is we wanna be able to use rapid tests uh, in the diagnostic process as much as possible. And, and eventually if we could have everything based on rapid tests and give patients an immediate diagnosis, uh, that, that would be wonderful. And that, that's something that we're working toward um, and diagnosis can definitely be improved because some of the, the challenges uh, that I mentioned earlier, where there's a small, uh, less than 5%, but patients who never get a conclusive uh, diagnostic result and the need to use uh, multiple tests and sometimes seeing discordance between different tests, depending on where they're implemented geographically. Uh, so if we have a a test that can work in all phases of disease and all the different geographies where Chagas disease takes place, uh, you know, that that would greatly simplify things in the future. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, moving from the diagnosis to the treatment, uh, obviously there are treatments for Chagas disease, benzonidazole and also nifritamox, um, but these were developed about 50 years ago, they do have their own shortcomings and sometimes very heavy side effects. And so I was wondering, uh, based building on what we were saying about the diagnostics, what's the future, um, Colin, for treatments for Chagas disease? And how do you feel that that would impact these community programs in general? Well, probably in the, thanks for that question. Uh, in the near future, uh, one of the things that, that DNDI, but also other investigators and partners are working on is uh, seeing if a shorter treatment with one of the current drugs, uh, benzonidazole, can be just as effective as what we're using now. And if that can be confirmed, uh, which still is gonna require a lot of research but if that can be confirmed, uh, it would really simplify the process for patients. Uh, number one, by providing a shorter treatment period, uh, you, you know, we just uh, published uh, last year the results of our Bendita study, which suggests that a two week treatment uh, might be effective compared to what we currently use, which is an eight week treatment. So that's a significant reduction. It would also mean less expense for the patients in terms of having to travel to healthcare facilities, less complementary testing. So I mentioned the you know tests of renal and hepatic function, which patients have to undergo now to make sure that they're strong enough to tolerate the treatment. Basically, uh, if we could reduce that, it would also reduce costs for the healthcare system and patients. That would simplify things a great deal. Uh, but again, you know we also are going to need a new treatment, and, and that's probably still uh, several years away in terms of having a, a new drug that that can perhaps be more effective than, than benzonidazole and nefertamax and safer. Uh, and also we need, along with that, a good test of cure. So we'd like to know as soon as patients are treated, uh, how has treatment worked or do they need to be retreated? Uh, and right now with the tests we have available, you know, we have to wait several years, if not decades, uh, to see any kind of kind of a change. So we need mm -hmm. we, we, we need better technology in that regard. That's really interesting. And um, so clearly sort of the working on the treatments that's in good hands with yourselves at DNDI and your partners. But um, do you feel there's anyone there's are there any partners missing at the table? Is there an someone, partners that you'd like to see more of to really accelerate these efforts? Yeah, I don't know that uh, anyone is necessarily missing at, at the table. 
but uh, I would just say that we need a concerted effort uh, to, to make progress here. And the most critical is uh, governments, I think. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you see that you have a commitment from government uh, to addressing the problem like we've seen in, in Colombia, uh, it makes a huge impact. Uh, but in other cases, I mean, Chagas continues to be an invisible disease uh, both because biologically, because of its asymptomatic period, but also uh, politically, uh, because people who are primarily impacted uh, don't always have a strong political voice. Uh, so we really need, you know, better advocacy, but we also need commitment from commitment from all the governments in countries that are affected. And I'm not only talking about Latin America, but, uh, you know, Europe and the U.S. as well, where where, where people are living with disease, uh, and, and maybe you know to get together and, and do something about the problem. That's wonderful, um, and maybe coll further collaborations with completely different sectors, maybe um, of the built environment, vector control, and so forth. Have you? Do you feel there's enough of those? Is is Chagas um, well implanted in the agenda of constructors or um, municipalities tackling vector control and so forth? Yeah, well, that, that raises a whole other issue. Um, you know, the, I didn't go into this a lot in my presentation, but the, the risk of exposure uh, to kissing bugs is, is really dependent on housing conditions. And so really it's been shown that the best way to sustainably prevent the disease is, is improving housing conditions in, in rural areas. Uh, but most of the time we've opted for, for using pesticides uh, in, instead, which is certainly a lower cost solution. Uh, eventually, I mean, Chagas disease, you have to see it as, as a, social, a social problem. And so addressing it has to be linked to a broader social agenda in which you know housing is improved uh, 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 the environment is 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 cared for and uh, sustainable uh, jobs are available for people in affected communities um, so really just trying to address Chagas as only one small piece of that uh, mm -hmm. is going to run into those kinds of barriers and so really it, it just has to be part of a broader agenda Wonderful, thank you. And uh, John Gibb, who's uh, joined us, is also asking in the chat: Is this therefore not a Go Colombia priority? Oh, oh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Uh... Well, I just <laughs> at the same time also very quickly tried to Google Go, Go Colombia. I thought <laughs> maybe is like a um, a campaign or a hashtag that I'm not very familiar with. But um, perhaps, John, did you mean Colombian government or um, maybe you could add to your comment in the chat if you have the, the, the moment to do so? Oh, yeah, my, my apologies. I'm just not familiar with uh, with Go Colombia. Yeah. I thought it was just me. I thought it was <laughs> second nature to those involved in the country. Um, government, oh, government. Oh, no, thank no. you. Okay. And, Excuse my, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, my, my apologies. My uh, apologies too. <laughs> no, I think I think in the Colombian case, it is a priority for for the government, and, and otherwise, this project would not have been been possible. Uh, so, really, uh, we're grateful to the the government of Colombia and the Ministry of Health and all of the different actors uh, for making this possible and having that commitment. And uh, you know, hopefully, more governments in uh, in the region and in the world uh, will will follow that example. Well, Colin, thank you very much. Um, we've gone a little bit over our time allocated today, but it's been so fascinating and a real pleasure to spend some time with you, learning about where your Chagas program has got to particularly as this is so so embedded in the um, ethos and in the, the kind of approach and methodology at DNDI. Uh, in a way, an organization that's both quite young and then unbelievably nearly two decades old as well. 20 years have just sort of flown by, but 
it's always very impressive to hear of what you're doing and how you're doing it. And uh, we thoroughly enjoyed the paper. So thank you so much for um, giving us a bit of your time today to present this. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to Cameron and, and, and ISNTD for, for giving us this opportunity to, to, to present today. Uh, always a pleasure and a big, big thank you as well to all those who uh, joined us in the audience. And uh, we look forward to hearing um, about your next steps in the near future. Um, in uh, thanks. I would look forward to, to, to that in the future. And, and thanks also to everybody for being here today.